Hey, I trust you had a good Thanksgiving uh, this past week, got to have some conversations with some of you, and you told me about family in, or you told me about uh, being someplace, and always makes for an interesting Sunday after Thanksgiving, and uh, quite honestly, I love it because I get to see people that maybe I haven't seen, like like Scott, who was up doing our communion, uh, been longtime members of our church, lives in Edmond, works at a church there now, uh, but his family's here, and man, I love uh, seeing young people that come back and seeing uh, other uh, family members, uh, some of you, your parents are with you, your kids are with you, and uh, always a lot of fun uh, to be able to share those times together. So for those of you maybe that haven't been around, we have been this entire year uh, walking through a series through the book of Acts we've called Ordinary, and we've intentionally called it that because I believe that the story in Acts is not about just apostles. It certainly is. It's not just about a man named Paul, while it certainly is about his story. It's not just about the Holy Spirit. Quite honestly, the Holy Spirit is undergirding every story, and so it's certainly that. But it's also the story of ordinary believers, people like you, people like me, who just throughout this book, this story that we have of the early church, just continued to share and believe and trust in Jesus. And uh, as we've said, you and I are here today because of what takes place here and what takes place in between. And so we're actually in the last two chapters today of Acts. So Acts chapter 27, if you've got your Bible, I want you to turn there, Acts chapter 27. We're going to race through these two chapters, and then we're going to be done with the text. We're not done with the series today. We're going to be done with the text of the book of Acts. We're going to take a break for Christmas, and then the very last Sunday of the year, uh, December 31st, we're going to be, for one more time, talking about ordinary believers, and we're going to take it from the end of the book of Acts till current day, and we're going to talk about ordinary people who just through the last 2,000 years have continued this thing of the faith, our Christianity, and again, you and I are here today because of some of those people. So we left off with Paul in Jerusalem. Paul was uh, uh, there with Jewish leaders who were dogging him, just continued to to harass him, and uh, rumors flying about him, and and, and people believing things about him. And so he's going to go down to Caesarea now, and he's going to be before Felix. Remember, we talked about this just last week. Governor Felix, and then uh, Governor Felix just held on to him for two years, refused to make any kind of decision. I'll call for you when it's convenient, was the words that he used. So then another governor comes along. His name is Festus, and really not much takes place during that time frame. He has an appearance before King Agrippa and King Agrippa's wife, Bernice, and there was a whole story behind that. Go back and listen to that that sermon if you want to know more about it. Finally, it comes down to where Paul realizes there's not going to be any justice done, and he believes that God has called him to Rome, and so he makes his appeal to Caesar. And so he's going to go to Rome, and he's going to appear before Nero uh, the emperor. And we talked about how multiple times through these passages, Paul has gotten the opportunity to share his story. But it wasn't always in the best of times. In fact, most of the times, Paul's in chains when he's telling his story. And so we, we kind of just summed it up last week saying this, that your greatest witness may be during your darkest hour. Your greatest witness may be during the difficult time of your life. You may have thought it was going to be at your good time when you were dressed up, when you had it planned, when it was on your calendar, when it looked good, when you felt good, but most of the time that's not the case. Most of the time, it's going to be when you're dealing with a difficulty, when you've got a child that's, that's uh, the, the, the relationship's not working out, when you've got the cancer diagnosis, when you lost a loved one sometime, and people are going to look at you, and that's going to be the opportunity for you to be your greatest witness and to share the story of Jesus. So that's where we left off. Now in chapter 27 and 28, we are going to see a lot of details about what's going to happen in Paul's life. You're going to see things about a a, a storm while he's on the water. You're going to see a shipwreck. You're going to see uh, stranded on on an island. You're going to see all kinds of things, and we're going to fly through it. But 
the question that I have is why does Luke include all of this detail? Why does he just get to the point? Now, Luke's a, a physician, and so he likes the observation, he likes the detail, but there's a lot of it in here, and I'm wondering why. And I'm going to tell you at the end. So let's get into a little bit of it. Paul and company are headed to Rome. They're going to appear. He is going to appear before the emperor. The very beginning of Acts chapter 27 kind of sets it up for us. When the time came, we set for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius, a captain of the Imperial Regiment, and also a guy named Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also with us. So if you've noticed, we've got back to the narrative where the writer of this is saying, well, we did this. We set sail for Rome. So we know Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is with Paul. We also know that Aristarchus is with him. Aristarchus is from Thessalonica. Now, it doesn't say that he's a prisoner here. Other prisoners are with Paul. But Later on in Colossians 4.10, Paul says that Aristarchus is a fellow prisoner. He's in prison with me. And so they are all together, additional prisoners. Now this is a boat that they've just kind of, you know, uh, commandeered. This, this centurion probably uh, uh, got on board and, and is able to take his prisoners. And now they are on their way to Rome. And if we read through every single detail, you would read about this storm. We'll certainly talk about that. There's going to be a shipwreck. There's going to be an island rescue. All kinds of things are going to take place. I want to skip all the way down to verse 14. And it says, The weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island and blew us out to sea. And so things aren't going good from the get-go. They set sail, a storm comes together. We're going to re- you'll see if you were to read through the details, I hope you'll go through and catch all this up. The sailors are so concerned about it, they throw ropes underneath the ship, they tie, they literally tie the ship together. At some point, they're going to throw their cargo overboard. At some point, they're going to even get rid of all the tackle. We're talking about the sails and everything that's just extra, and they're just going to, you know, trust in God, right? I mean, we're done here. There's nothing else we can do. That's the predicament that they're in. Verse 20, it does get a little worse. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last... All hope was gone. I mean, if you thought it was bad, now they're just seen. We haven't seen the sky for days. And so all hope was gone for them. All the way down to verse 23, Paul says to all the crew, to all the prisoners, to the soldiers, last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, Don't be afraid, Paul. For you will surely stand before Caesar. He's got that promise before. And so now, now the angel's saying, listen, you're, this, is, this is not the end. It looks bad, but I promise you, you're going to Rome and you're going to be before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God, it will be just as he said. And so Paul is able to share with all of these fellow passengers, whether they believe it or not, he's able to share with them, listen, God's promised me this, and in his goodness, all of us are going to make it. It, All of us are going to make it because he's made a promise that I am going to be here. God is going to spare the lives of all those who are on board so that Paul could be brought before Caesar. We see an instance here, we see it multiple times throughout Scripture, that God is going to use a righteous man to bless a lot of sinful people, to preserve even some sinful people. So what's going to happen is they are eventually going to be, uh, you know, go, go shipwreck. I mean, they, they, are going to, they are going to bust the ship up. You know, they, they know they got to leave the ship. Uh, it, it's getting bad. Verse 42 says that the soldiers are planning to kill the prisoners because they know that if these prisoners escape, that they will receive the punishment that was due the prisoner. So they're ready to kill them. Verse 43, though, the centurion keeps them from doing that. He keeps them from carrying out their plan because of how much he cares for Paul. And so once again, we see 
the life of Paul is sparing other people. Once again, we see that somebody who's living a godly life not only is is preserved and saved themselves, but there are people that kind of follow along because of that. In fact, I came across this quote from F.F. Bruce that I think just kind of sums it up for us. Human society has no idea how much it owes in the mercy of God to the presence of righteous men and women. Some of you can, can testify to that because there's somebody in your life and you're like, I wouldn't be alive if it weren't for them. Wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for my grandma. Wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for that friend at, at work. I, I wouldn't have made it if it wasn't for that person. We, we don't know the extent of that, but we do know that there are people in this world, and maybe, maybe you're one of those, there are people in this world, and because of your love for God and your faithfulness to Him, there are a whole lot of people whose trajectory in life has changed because of your faith. Because of your, your following Jesus, and they recognize that, and, and they've just kind of, just like Paul, people are spared because God has a plan for Paul. Human society has no idea how much it owes to the presence of righteous men and women. And so all of these people are going to be spared. They make it to this island, Malta. They make it there, and, and, and they're going to be saved. And immediately they build this great big fire to warm everybody up. And then you read about Paul as he's picking up some firewood. He's bitten by a viper, by a poisonous snake. And, and all the people think that he's going to die. But he has no symptoms. He doesn't die. He doesn't even, uh, you know, and, and no infection, and no, no, no problems there. And so they recognize that. They ask him to come and heal the, the, the chief official's father, and he does that. That man is healed. Paul heals him. Then other people are from the island are brought to him, and they're healed, and they're, they're cured. And so here they stay for three months through the winter season before they're finally able to sail. And then we're going to get into some of the meat of what we want to talk about. Verse 13 now we're all the way in chapter 28. By the way, if you're following along, flip the page or whatever you got to do. It says, a, few, a day later, a south wind began blowing. So the following day, we sailed up the coast to Patoli. There we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them. So they catch a ship. They catch the wind. They sail to Italy. They set land at Patoli. And the first thing they do is they find some Christians there. Now, this is, this is the outskirts of Rome. We're, we're still 100 miles away, but, but uh, uh, here we are, outskirts of Rome, and they find some other disciples, some other believers. And you've got to ask the question, where did these believers come from? Because at this point, Paul's never been to Italy. At this point, none of the other apostles have ever been there. There are disciples there because they have organically spread there. It, it, it wasn't some leader. It wasn't some you know, well-known person. This was unnamed people who maybe were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost back in chapter 2. And when they went home, they just kind of spread the word of Jesus. And here this port city in Italy now shows the results of people having brought the gospel there. There are disciples that are in Patoli, in Italy, and they are welcoming Paul. Now, he's still 100 miles from Rome, but the journey now is by land. Look what else happens. Still verse 14 so we came to Rome, the brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming, and they came to meet us all the way at the forum, forum of the Appian Way. Others, it says, joined us at three taverns. If you've got a map in your Bible, you can flip through and find where all these places, they're just making their way north uh, to Rome. And when Paul saw them, he was encouraged and he thanked God. So I want you to catch this. Christians came all the way from Rome and they honored Paul by meeting him, walk down to meet him, and then they're going to walk all the way back. We're talking about a 40-mile trip. Listen, I, I love lots of you, but I'm probably not walking 40 miles to see you and then walk 40 miles back. I mean, that's a pretty impressive uh, show of honor right there. That's what these people are, are doing. Now, this is 
This is Paul's first time here. First time that he's ever been to Rome. But three years earlier, he had written to the church in Rome. It's a book in your New Testament called Romans. So he wrote to them, and he identified in that letter that he wrote some 28 different people that he already knew. He identifies at least five different churches that are meeting in different homes throughout the city. And so that's why the people come to meet him. They read his letter. They knew how badly he wanted to see them. And some of the people that were mentioned in that letter to the Romans were likely some of those people that were coming and meeting Paul. They were part of the welcoming group. And it says Paul thanked them and was encouraged by all this. Man, who wouldn't be to see disciples that are coming, people that, that are fellow followers of Jesus? What a, what, a, what a great thing for Paul to see. Verse 16 says, When we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. Three days after Paul's arrival, he called together the local Jewish leaders. Now, God had promised Paul that he would get to to Rome. In fact, on the ship, he was promised. We read it. You will appear before Caesar. Now he's in Rome. I want you to notice he's not in prison. Not this time. He's been in prisons before. He will be in dungeons in Rome at another point in time later on. But he's not in prison right now. He's under house arrest. And he has lots of latitude. Lots of people can come see him. He's going to have lots of visitors. But he's chained to the wrist by a soldier. In fact, in the course of these two years, there is going to be a palace guard, a praetorian guard, that is going to be on duty with Paul all the time, chained to him all the time. They rotated every four hours, and so somebody is going to be chained to him. Can you imagine being chained to the apostle Paul for hours upon time, right? What do you want to talk about, Paul? (laughs) And Paul has this captive audience. He has this open door to be able to, to share with people. Not only would Paul share with you, but you couldn't help but overhear what Paul was talking about to all the visitors that came in. He's going to talk about Jesus. He's going to share the gospel with them. And you couldn't help but notice his character. Everything that he did was because he followed Jesus. In fact, it's in likely this apartment chained to one of these guards that he is going to write to the Philippians, and he's going to explain how his suffering has advanced the gospel. So one of the New Testament letters, again, that uh, Paul wrote, Philippians, right, writing to the church in Philippi, wrote from the, written from this place right here. Listen to Philippians 1, 12 to 14. It says, I want you to know, brothers, it's what happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Well, that sounds just like what we talked about last week, about our darkest hour, right? Your greatest testimony during your darkest hour, what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard. So these guys that are chained to him, he's saying, it's become clear to them and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. In fact, he goes on, because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. He says, not only have I noticed that what I'm I'm doing, it is serving to advance the gospel, but other people have seen it and it's encouraged them. It's caused them to be more bold and more courageous as they, they talk with other people. And so they've got these these guards that are that are with Paul 24 hours a day. The Praetorian Guard or the Palace Guard, it was the Imperial Guard of Rome. They were an elite corps of soldiers. They were established to to watch over the, the Roman emperor. They were distinguished by double pay. They had special privileges. I mean, this is an elite bunch of people right here. And Paul recognizes that even in spite of this, this group that is, is guarding him, that that even with all of that, this is not a difficulty. His confinement was not some overwhelming difficulty or barrier to the gospel. He looked at it 
as a way to have a wider impact. In fact, most scholars think that there were probably 9,000 of these palace guards or praetorian guard, and that revival likely started with just one or two of these Roman soldiers who were chained to this one man, and it just spread. And the news spread from guard to guard, and then to the families of these guards, and then even to Caesar's household. I mean, these are some of the same guards that were watching over Caesar. And so it had to, it had to give a, a, a lot of encouragement and, and a lot of comfort to, to the people hearing that. In fact, listen to what he says in Philippians 4.22 that just is an encouragement. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. So Paul's writing to his friends in Philippi, and he's writing from, you know, Rome here. He's chained to a soldier, and he says, oh yeah, some of the Christians who are now part of Caesar's household, maybe Caesar's family, they also are, are greeting you as well. Man, what, a, what an amazing witness this man is having. And God using the circumstances that you and I might look at as, as terrible, God's using it for his good. Now, back to Acts. As customary, Paul's going to do what he did in lots of places. He's going to engage the Jewish audience. He can't go to the synagogue like he often did when he came into, into town because he is under house arrest. But he invites them to come to him. Look what he says, verse 20. He says, I asked you to come here today so we could get acquainted, so I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. So Paul invites these Jewish leaders and Jewish people to come see him, and maybe there were multiple waves of people that are doing that. And he says, these chains right here, I'm seeing it as just as an opportunity for me to be able to tell you about Jesus the Messiah. In fact, they believed that a Messiah would come, and he says, this is the one that has come, and his name is Jesus. The hope of Israel, what he's talking about there is, is Jesus. Look at their response, verse 22. It says, we want to hear what you believe, for the only thing we know about this movement is that it is denounced everywhere. So we want to hear more about what you have to say, Paul. We want to hear more. We don't know anything. In fact, apparently they don't know anything about Paul, so word hasn't spread to them about, you know, how bad he is from other Jewish people back in Jerusalem or Judea. They didn't know anything about him. Apparently they don't know anything about Christianity except that there's people speaking against it. They didn't know the facts. They didn't know the ideas or the theology behind it. They didn't know who Jesus is. Just that people are speaking against it. Isn't that still true today? That's, for some people, all they know about Christianity is that there's some things about it they don't like. That some people are speaking bad about it. There are people who don't know anything about Christianity. Now, this is what they do know, that there are a lot of weird Christians out there, and a lot of people are talking bad about them. And, and maybe that's you. Maybe you're here today, and that's, that kind of sums up what you think about this whole thing. You, if that's you, ought to do what these Jewish leaders did, to hear it for yourself to find out about it. We want to hear more about that. Don't reject Christianity simply because you've heard other people speak bad about it. Explore it. Investigate it. Look into it. Find out for yourself what this thing is really all about. So that's what happens. Verse 23, it says, He explained to them morning and evening. So all day long, Paul is sharing with some of these Jewish people about what he believes about, about Jesus and, and what Christianity is. And verse 24 says, some were persuaded by the things he said, but others didn't believe. 
That's kind of been the pattern that we've seen, right? He shares the gospel, or anybody does. They share the gospel, and some people are convinced, and other people are like, eh, I'm not sure about this, or they, they will put it off. And so Paul goes on, and he quotes from the prophet Isaiah. You can read that in some of the last few verses of the book of Acts. They're at the end of chapter 28. And it's about a time in the Old Testament, 700 years before this event, where there were people that heard and rejected God. And here's why. It wasn't because they looked at it and they went, nah, I don't believe that. It was because they didn't want to be healed from their sin. They didn't want to leave their sin behind. That, that's the true reason why lots of people reject Jesus and Christianity is Really, I'd have to stop doing some things that I really like doing. And in that case, it would be more honest to say, Jesus, I reject you because there's some things I love more than you than to say, I'm not sure I, I believe. And that's what Isaiah is saying. Just be honest about it. Just be honest. That's what Paul's, Paul's saying. Now, I want to I look just last two verses there. These are the last words that we have in the book of Acts. Verse, verse 30 and 31, just kind of a wrap-up. Luke says, for the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. So Rome's not paying for all this. He's got his apartment rent he's got there. He's got food. and So apparently people are taking care of him. Maybe he's got some money put aside. It says he welcomed all who visited him boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. Maybe your version says he was unhindered in that. So Paul, who loved to travel, he couldn't travel, but he could have people over, and he could talk with them, and he could have conversation with them, and he could write in fact, we know, we've already talked about it. He wrote Philippians, but he also wrote the book of Ephesians. He also wrote the book of Colossians. These two years were not wasted. He didn't just you know, sit around and you know, watch Netflix. He, he's, he's at it. He's doing something here. Not wasted. Easy to find yourself in a place sometimes where you feel like you can't do anything. Maybe you're thinking right now where you are in your situation at your job or where you live or what you do that there's nothing I can do about the gospel or advance the kingdom or help in any of this guard. You feel like you're just in a place and you don't know why God has you there and you're like, this is, this, this is just being wasted. I wish I could do more. And Paul looked at it as an opportunity and he took the opportunity. Makes me think of my friend, dear friend, Joanne Beaver. Many of you know her here. A lot of times she's greeting right back at this door, one of the older ladies in our church. Lost her husband uh, just a couple of years ago. Moved into a retirement center not long ago. And she's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just, I, I'm losing my friends and I don't have the neighbors to take care of. And it wasn't long she was in this retirement center and she came to me and she says, Pastor, that's what she always calls me. She goes, Pastor, I found what God wants me to do. People come to me all the time and they say, will you pray for me about this? And she goes, I don't just tell them I'll pray for them. I pray for them right there. So here's somebody that's, that's going, I'm, I'm not going to waste this time. In this place where it may look like there's not much to do, I'm going to do everything that I can and that's, what Joanne did, that's what Paul did. And you may be thinking, that what happens? That's the end. We don't, we don't know anything else to the story. Well, pre pretty reliable historians tell us that Paul would eventually speak to Nero, that he would get an audience there, that he would be acquitted of his charges, he would be released. He was free for probably four to five years. He visited some churches. Tradition has that he made it as far as Spain to share the gospel. Later we know that he was back in Ephesus to see friends there. He was arrested again. And this time he was shackled in a dungeon in Rome. And historians are pretty certain that Paul would have lost his life around A.D. 67. Tradition has it that he was 
beheaded. We don't know any of that for sure. That's just some church tradition. But it's not the end of the story. In fact, Paul, through these last few days, was unhindered. No one tried to stop him. And so it transcended his house arrest. It transcended his language barriers, ethnicity, geography. What we see is that the gospel can't be stopped. In fact, I think that's why there's so much detail in this story that you read through there and you hear about snake bites and you hear about shipwrecks and you hear about terrible storms and, you know, you've sat down with somebody and they've told their vacation story and brought out the pictures. We went here and then we ate this and then we saw this thing and you're just bored to tears through that. And it doesn't, it doesn't have that feel to it. You go, why all this detail? Here's why I think Luke includes all this detail, and it's simply for this reason here, that nothing can stop the gospel going to the ends of the earth. Not a shipwreck. That didn't stop it. Not chains. That didn't stop it. Not a storm. That didn't stop it. Not people trying to kill him. That that didn't stop it. Nothing could stop the gospel going to the ends of the earth. In fact, that is kind of the symbolic fulfillment of, that Jesus laid out in Acts 1.8, right? You will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And now when Paul gets to literally what would be the fulfillment of that, to Rome, this is the fulfillment of catching the entire Roman Empire. Nothing has been able to stop it. And you know what? 2,000 years later we can look back and go, nothing's been able to stop this. You realize people have killed Christians thinking, we're going to snuff this out. People have burned Bibles. They said, if we just get rid of these Bibles, we burn them all. They burned every Bible they can find. Nothing can stop it. They can burn churches. They can shut it down. Governments have tried to. In fact, governments right now, there are places in this world that we think of as the darkest places in the world, places like Iran. And you go, why? Well, that's, I would not want to be, you know what? Fastest growing church in Iran right now. In places where it is illegal and you can lose your life, sometimes the fastest growing churches around. That's what Jesus promised at the very beginning of this book when we started it, that it would go to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. And so what each of us has to decide as a part of this is, am I going to be a part of that? Am I going to be a part of this this progress? Am I going to be a part of being a witness to the ends of the earth? Am I going to be a witness? Am I going to be a part of that? Or am I going to let it happen without me? Because the book of Acts tells us it's going to happen. This is going to happen. It's going to go to every place. The question is, are you and I going to be a part of it? Are you and I going to be written into the story? See, I think that's why Luke leaves the book of Acts, the end of Acts, open-ended and unresolved. And we look at it and we want to go, we want to know what happened. What happened when Paul's before Nero What did Paul say to him? How did the emperor respond? And the truth is, we don't know. But we do know this, that Acts doesn't end. The story of ordinary believers, it doesn't end. It's continually being written. We don't know what happens in the story, but I do believe this, that it goes on with millions and millions of verses following the ones that we read, that will only be read in eternity. So why not you and me being ordinary people, why not, why don't we write ourselves into the story? Why don't we go, that's such a beautiful, amazing story. I want to be a part of that. 
I want to be one of the ordinary that for 2,000 years has perpetuated the gospel. And if Jesus delays his coming for another 100 years or 1,000 years or 2,000 years, whatever he chooses, that I'm going to be a part of that. Those verses that are written about people who are sharing the gospel, unnamed people maybe who are sharing the gospel and people coming to know, why not write ourselves into this story? I think that's why Luke leaves it open like that, so that we can say, I want to do that. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of ordinary. Father, thank you for teaching us today. And we are so grateful that the gospel cannot be stopped and that it came to us, and it came to our family, and it came to our town, and it came to our world and we are grateful for that, Father. Thank you for, for loving us. Thank you for calling us to yourself. Thank you for, for giving us the gift of faith. And thank you, Father, for, for loving us to that degree. And I'm, I'm praying, Father, that, that uh, you're going to help us to be that army of ordinary uh, believers that continue to share the story of Jesus and to share our belief and our faith. Father, would you in embolden us by the things that we've read today? Would you encourage us by the things that we've read today? Even the details, the uh, intricate things that we read about, Father, knowing that it's all a reminder that the gospel cannot be stopped. We want to be a part of that. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.